there. That's that bit done. Sorry, I had to read from that because um, it's all a bit, uh, uh, you know, it's a new thing for us. So my name's Linda Crowley and I'm a Trading Standards Officer with Bucks and Surrey. And this is a joint presentation today with um, my colleague, well, Mark Godslin from Thames Valley. Thanks, Mark. And Sarah Hobbs, who's kindly providing British Sign Language interpretation throughout. And Mark is going to kick off with staying, talking about staying safe from cybercrime. OK, thank you very much, Linda. Hello, good morning, everybody. Very nice to be here and presenting to you today. I'm going to turn my camera off now. Sarah's obviously going to be signing what I'm saying and then we'll take it from there. So just bear with me a minute, please. OK, everybody. We're here to talk to you really today about cybercrime and we're going to focus on what the cyber aware initiative is run by the national cyber security center next slide please if you'd like to click all the way through until you get to where it says action fraud at the top that's it fine thank you okay a little bit about us i'm mark godsland i work for thames valley police i'm not a police officer my role function in the police is what we call cyber protect officer. But for the public's consumption, I'm a police cyber security advisor. I'm not technically based. Uh, I don't have those skill sets. My job is to try and educate, inform, signpost, guide people through what they need to be doing to reduce the threat, risk and harm to them if they use the online services that most of us use today. So Thames Valley are one of the local forces within the southeast region, the other forces being Hampshire, Surrey and Sussex, who are one joint force now. And then we all work in uh, collaboration with the Regional Organised Crime Unit. Thames Valley are now part of that in terms of cyber. So it doesn't mean that we're uh, exclusively working in the southeast. We still have the Thames Valley Police Cyber Crime Unit, and that's made up of by one detective inspector, a detective sergeant, and also five detective constables. And their job is to investigate crimes that are at a local level, in other words, forced level, uh, cyber dependent crime, which is computer on computer. Now, my job as cyber protector officer is to do what I'm doing now, uh, but also about that is trying to help people. We as a region are the Southeast region and they look at all regional organised crime, trying to target uh, serious organised crime at a regional level. They work also with the National Crime Agency at a um, wi much wider national level. And then we work in partnership with National Cyber Security Centre, but also with Action Forward. And we'll talk about that later. Next slide, please. So today is a high level overview of threat, risk and harm from the perspective to the wider community, in other words, individuals. And all these slides that you see today are going to be made available to you as a PDF document at some stage, either today or later this week. There's no need for you to take notes because clearly the information is there. Although there's a lot of writing, that is because obviously you are going to be receiving this at some stage in the future and it adds context to what I'm saying. So I'm not going to be reading everything out to you. I'm going to be talking to you about the things that we all need to be doing to keep ourselves safe online. And you can see the agenda that we're talking about. So it's cyber aware, reporting suspicious websites, emails and text messages, content and help for the deaf community, how and where to report crime, including obviously people who are hard in hearing or deaf, and then a summary and signposting of further advice, guidance and information. Next slide, please. For those you don't know, CyberWare forms part of the National Cyber Security Centre's uh, guidance across the whole of communities. So we're talking now as us as individuals and families, micro and small medium enterprises, in other words, businesses, larger organisations, the public sector, and then also the cybersecurity industry. So CyberAware is led by the National Cybersecurity Centre, developed in partnership with the Cabinet Office, Home Office and the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. So we're going to just talk about what CyberAware is in terms of the guidance that you can access. 
and primarily it's about protecting your accounts. That's talking about email and social media accounts and protecting your devices, your data and your personal information. Next slide, please. I just wanted to touch on a little bit about passwords uh, and we will talk about how you can create those in, in a later slide. On the left hand side in the sort of the salmon color image, you'll see the 10 most common used passwords. And we know this because of the research that's done by the DCMS, but also by the Cabinet Office and also other people interested in cybersecurity. Now, if any of these passwords are the ones that you use, then please very much pay attention. Uh, and I suggest that you follow the guidance that we're going to give you shortly about changing your passwords because they are vulnerable. And the other issue about passwords is that unfortunately people use information that's very easy to remember. They don't realize that sometimes the guidance or the, the, the passwords that they are creating or have created are actually made available on their social media platforms. So for example, if you use a favorite football team, they use the passwords you can see there. They use their date of birth and the mother's maiden name. But sometimes people do leave this information on the social media platform. So please don't share too much information about yourself that someone could use to guess your password. The graphic on the right just gives you an illustration in terms of if your uh, password is of four characters in length, you can see it's going to be you know, compromised immediately if somebody was what's to call brute force your uh, account and brute force means basically means using a computer to use common known directories and information that's probably available already to try and guess people's passwords but it's done at a very very quick level so the more characters you have the more difficult it is to actually um, crack your password now in terms of threat risk and harm you know are your accounts at risk well yes they are why because your email account is the gateway to everything else in your life. So it's really important that you secure your um, email account first of all, but also your social media accounts. Next slide, please. So the guidance from the National Cybersecurity Center is as follows. You do need to have a strong and unique password or different password for your email account. Now, how you do that is entirely up to you, but they've they come up with the phrase three random words and you can see an example of a password down at the bottom where it says hippo pizza rocket one and if you add a character or number to the beginning and the end of that you increase the complexity and the length of that and you make it far more difficult to crack and to easily guess now we know that people sometimes don't want to use this and that's fine but please do not use passwords or create a password that's made up of stuff that's already available about you on the internet either through data breaches or what's on your social media platform or that's that's very easy to guess you can also use a, another process and we'll talk about that in a moment so please don't use things like your pet's name numbers you know associated with yourself and there's guidance every link in blue at the bottom of every page or this inner page takes you to where you can go and get further guidance so please consider that uh, as a really primary thing to do. If your passwords to your accounts are not unique and are not complex. Next slide, please. The second thing we need to do about securing our account. So once we've made our account secure in terms of the password, imagine your password or your social media account or your email account is your castle. Now to protect your castle, use a password. That is the moat. But another line of, of security defense in depth is use what is called two step verification, but it's also known as multi factor authentication or 2FA, two factor authentication. But for the purposes of CyberAware, they call it two step verification. Now, this two step verification is like a figurative um, keep to your castle, so it's another line of security. So even if someone has access to your password, they can't gain access to your account because they need another bit of information. And this is what two step verification is. It is really easy to do. You just follow the online process that detailed on the links that you can access, obviously, when you get those documents in the future and it will take you through that process. But please don't just leave this for your email account. You can do this for your social media accounts as well. So please bear that in mind. Next slide, please. 
OK, these are examples of two step verification. So the one on the left, the phone is what is called an SMS message. The, the blue padlock is the um, Microsoft Authenticator app. The middle one is the, what looks like a G or a press button. That is the Google one. And on the right hand side, you see a physical key, a pass key, and that would usually be used by people who have business accounts. So to gain access to a program or a service, you put that device in, that would generate a key and you place that in then to the these area that you need to access. And then the bottom just really validates what it is. Password validation access. So you need to be thinking about your email account, your social media accounts and any um, other online account. Why are we focusing on this? Well, I have to contact or I deal with victims whose accounts have been taken over primarily because they didn't have a strong unique password. Secondly, because they didn't have two step verification on. Had those been in place, the likelihood of someone accessing the account would have been a lot smaller. Clearly, there are some times when people's accounts are compromised or in inverted commas hacked. But these are the front principles that we need to be adopting all of us in our digital lives. Next slide, please. OK, creating passwords. Well, we talked about the three random words. Um, you can create your own if you want to. Um, that, that's fine as long as you make sure you manage them and you keep them in a secure place. Another way you can actually um, create password is using your browser. So a browser is, for example, Edge, which is the now the Microsoft uh, Internet browser. Uh, could be uh, Google Chrome. It could be Brave. It could be Firefox or whatever. And these uh, now can generate passwords for you. The problem about that is, is that if you use a device and you share that device with other people in your family or your community and you have a shared common login, it is not a good idea to do that because clearly the, the browser stores that password. So when you click on that, if it says save this for next time, someone else could access that if they got to your device. So you don't use the browser element if you share your device with other people. Alternatively, you can use what is called a password manager. There are a lot of password managers out there. For those of you listening who have, say, for example, a internet service provider or a mobile uh, data network provider, they may give you as part of your package, your overall 18 month, two year package, um, some element of a, a, a password manager. But, but that will only probably only uh, enable you to save, say, five to 10 passwords. If it's me, I've got at least 50. So I use a password manager and it works for me. But although there are free ones out there, if you want to one that's a bit more complex and stores passwords in, in secure vaults, then you may have to pay a retainer over a year. And that works out anything probably from 50 pence to maybe a, um, 75 pence a day over a year. But again, that's the decision for you to do. But again, it's another means by which you can secure your passwords. Clearly, you need to make sure, however, that your password for your password manager is really complicated and secure and you don't tell anybody else that. Otherwise, they can gain access to that. Next slide, please. Thank you. OK, the information that we have about ourselves on our devices is really valuable. It's valuable to us, but clearly it's valuable to other people. Now, the problem is that uh, a lot of people are connected to the Internet these days in terms of their mobile device or their tablet. And when I say the problem, the problem is that if they lose that or it's stolen and they haven't got you know, decent security on that device in terms of either thumbprint, face recognition or a pin to secure it, then someone's going to gain access to your data. But think about the scenario where, for example, we were all suddenly in Venice. And we're on the Rialto Bridge and we're looking at the Grand Canal and then inadvertently someone comes along a bit too grumpily and knocks into one of us and our phone is knocked into the Grand Canal. Now, having been to Venice, I can tell you that the likelihood of you getting your device back is zero. And even if you did, it would be contaminated with seawater and all the, the, the silt inside the Grand Canal. So if that was your only device and that had all your memories on it then you're never going to get that data back. So if you back up your data, you've got to decide what it is that is important. Now, you can do that in several ways. You can either back up to the cloud. So every email account provider you have has a facility to have storage in the cloud, and the cloud is an online server, maybe somewhere in the world. 
could be in the UK, could be in, in Ireland, but it could be in America or somewhere else in Europe. Uh, but again, you've got to make sure that your password for that email account is really secure, because obviously if it's not and someone gains access, then clearly that information is going to be lost uh, and taken away from you. So please consider backing up your data. Alternatively, if you have a physical device such as a laptop or a desktop computer, um, you can use a physical hard drive that you plug in, you upload the information for side or side load it rather from your device to your portable hard drive. And when you finish, you disconnect it. So please bear that in mind. Next slide, please. Your devices, whatever device you're using today has a shelf life, but equally to that, it needs to have an operating system. And it's really, really important, please, that you do when it's when it tells you there's an update to be done, you do it as soon as possible, because the longer you leave it, the less likely it is it's going to have the security updates. Probably 80% of all service updates now for our devices are security related, where even five years ago, it was probably the other way around. So do please make sure you update your devices. If you don't want to do it there and then, then you can set up in settings for that device. You can do it overnight. And again, the links take you to the main devices that we all use to help you do that. So please, please, if I can stress anything, you please make sure your, your device is updated. Next slide, please. OK, cyber aware, not only does it give you all this, the, the, this guidance which I've given you, but it also has a action plan tool which you as an individual can go through. It just asks you some questions. You're not giving away any primary information about yourself. You're just answering a set of questions. That information is not stored anywhere. And at the end of that process, it gives you an action plan. If you are listening and you're a sole trader or a micro enterprise, there's one also there for small, medium enterprises that you can go through just to check you're doing the right things. Next slide, please. The next thing we need to talk about very quickly is how to recognize and report suspicious email, text, websites, adverts, et cetera. Now that's gonna be covered later on uh, by my colleagues in the trading standards department. But suffice it to say, there is a lot of content and guidance and information on the National Cybersecurity website. And that graphic you can see there is representative of what you can see. And you can see the information laid out on the left hand side. You open that up and it gives you more guidance. Next slide, please. OK, what can you do? What can I do to help the security services make sure that we take down suspicious websites? and um, scam emails, etc. If you don't know it already, you can forward that suspicious email to report at phishing.gov.uk. And on the right hand side, you can see uh, one of the, the most recent graphics that I could gain access to and the information where it says as of March of 2023, that's the, the last bit of information they've put up on their site, they, but they'll probably in about a week's time update that even more. They've taken down so many suspicious websites and all this has been since April 2020. And all this is down to us, the public, making sure that the National Cybersecurity Centre are aware and that they can take action on our behalf. If you want to check a website, you can go to the link there. It says get safe online, check websites. If you want to report a suspicious website, you have to do that through the link there to the National Cybersecurity Centre website. You can't do it like forwarding. Uh, as you would an email. If you get a suspicious text message, you can forward that to 7726. And if you want to report nuisance calls, you can do that to the Information Commissioner's Office. Next slide, please. OK, signposting. Uh, I think you need to go back up one. No, no, sorry, go, go back rather than And just one more. Thank you. OK, the last thing I'm going to co cover before we go on to signposting is the issue about reporting. If you have uh, an issue of cybercrime, so in other words, your account is being taken over or you have fraud, uh, you can report that to action fraud. You don't do that to your local force anymore. And action fraud is the national recording center for online crime, that's cyber and uh, fraud. They have social media platforms which you can gain uh, information about what's going trends are going on in, in the national area. 
uh, you can see the phone number there starting 0300. That is a line that's operating Monday to Friday, not at the weekends, or you can report that 24 seven through the live web chat. If you look at the top of, the, of it, you can see I've made a comment about BSL users, and I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. Where it says live 24 seven, uh, that's not for us, the public, that is for major ent enterprises, businesses, so they can report that direct to the center. So if, if for example, a company who deals in say data, that they're uh, either got denial of service attack or a ransomware attack or a serious cyber incident, they can report that straight away and then that can uh, gain the guidance and possible elements of PCU um, in interrogation so that we can start going through a incident reporting process. In terms of um, reporting to action fraud, please do so. Even if you heard bad things about it in the past, uh, it's changing. They're looking at a new service platform in terms of the, what you can see online. They are going to have a rebranding, but it's still going to be called action fraud. Even if your incident is not um, taken forward in terms of investigation, and not all of them are because there just isn't the capacity in the policing system to enable that, you reporting that will show what is going on because at the minute all we can see is the tip of the iceberg. So do please report to action fraud. Next slide, please. OK, in terms of signposting and guidance, just taking this forward before I conclude. Next slide, please. Thank you. As I, as I said earlier on, there is now this facility and it's been there for about six months where action fraud capacity or capability for BSL victims to report fraud and cybercrime. And there's information there and there's, there's guidance uh, through a video that you could click on in the future. Going forward, please. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, also, our colleagues at Police Scotland, but also it's a national resource now, British uh, sign through. There's information where you can actually gain uh, content about buying, selling secondhand devices, fake parcel scams and how to shop security online if you wish it in the format that, that obviously you use. And more content is being loaded all the time. But again, that's nothing that Thames Valley Police or even South East Region are, are, are looking at. This is a national initiative to help people from all different types of communities. Next slide, please. OK, two more slides for you. This is just really a summary of the guidance for individuals. And the whole aim of today is obviously to gain an understanding of and how to have a behavioural change towards making your email account more secure and your social media accounts. Make sure your devices are updated, make sure your data is, is protected, and why, where and how you can report fraud or cybercrime too. So all these links take you to different places. This is part of signposting, and you obviously you can take it forward from there. And last slide, please. Thank you. This just illustrates in terms of Thames Valley. Obviously, there's is uh, information there from our colleagues in the East Midlands uh, Serious Organised Crime Unit, um, which gives you a little bit more context in terms of the cyber elements, and that's something they did about four months ago. You can look to get alerts on advices on the National Cyber Security Centre. Thames Valley, like all police forces, have their own alert system. There are action fraud alerts, although they are very similar to the ones you get from Thames Valley. And we have a dedicated Twitter account, and you can see that there. So that concludes my, my session. Thank you ever so much uh, for uh, listening and watching. I hope you found it in, in, of the information of value. Very happy to discuss things at the end of the session. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, we'll go through the rest of these. So as, as this says, um, scams are fraud. It sounds very soft and fluffy, doesn't it, scams? But at the end of the day, um, these are organised criminals who use various means um, to defraud us. So we'll go through some of the other elements that Mark hasn't uh, mentioned. Um, statistics, fraud is the most commonly experienced crime currently and is about 42% of all crime against individuals. And I think we can all feel that, can't we? Because everybody will have been um, subject to a scam of one kind or another. Over 55s are more likely to be targeted, um, but the 16 to 34 age group are more susceptible to being scammed. Perhaps they're a bit more trusting about some of the elements because they've grown up with them rather than us older ones who are a bit more suspicious in some respects. And a third of those who are scammed will fall for a scam again, but 
uh, and to support what Mark said, only 5% of scams are reported. So it is really crucial that people do report via those means that, that Mark's mentioned. Anyone can be affected by a scam. We can all get caught out. Um, we can be at a low point. We can be vulnerable due to all manner of things at a particular point in time. Um, socially isolated people um, are also, you know, can be vulnerable. And certainly with um, the coronavirus, lots more people were socially isolated than had been before. So as we said, scams are not soft and fluffy. Wide boys, the Dell boys, these are organised predatory criminals who gain trust to exploit and steal money. They appear friendly, charming, um, all those things. And um, the other side of it is that they also use very persuasive language. So it's not that, that we are stupid, it's that they are really good at their jobs. They are really good at using language, which, which encourages us to, to go along with what they're trying to convince us of. And they are those things, charming and friendly, as I say. This is an illustration of a, a romance scam, which we um, had some dealing with. Um, this was a lady who was from the deaf community and along with the the growth of romance fraud during the pandemic um you know certain people can be susceptible to that and it's largely obviously those people who are lonely and who are looking for somebody else as a partner for them this um shows a couple of um texts which went between um the lady concerned and her sister she was largely estranged from her family um, and she was targeted by somebody who claimed their name was James William. Um, obviously, that probably wasn't their name. And as is common with romance fraud, they um, put forward a scenario where he really needed money from the love of his life, as he would put it, in order that he could get back to this country or escape from a situation um, where he was very vulnerable. And so the person that is being targeted obviously wants to help that person that they think they're in love with and who claims to love them. And they, in this case, he was saying that he worked for the United Nations um, and that he was going to get killed if he didn't have this money from her to enable him to escape. He groomed her to such an extent that she became very socially isolated from the rest of her family, who she, as I say, had a, a slightly um, difficult relationship with to start with. Um, it went on that we tried to safeguard her through um, other contacts with Site for Surrey and other means um, to try and help her. But she had been so effectively groomed that she wouldn't let anybody access and visit her um, to discuss what was going on and she didn't believe her family either. He'd used words in the texts between them and him to imply that, you know, this was really personal. This was between just the two of them and nobody else needed to know about it. And that's very typical. Um, but as I say, anyone who feels isolated and in the past, the deaf community have been uh, susceptible to quite a lot of romance fraud. So we wanted to make sure to flag that up. And again, you know, that's also been very common through the pandemic. Romance fraud has really gone through the roof. So to get people hooked and responding to scams, criminals rely on all these things, as we've said, vulnerable circumstances, um, people don't record, record it, partly because they're embarrassed, but also because they're perhaps not aware that they've been conned or, or are being conned. And there's a cycle. So the person receives a scam via whatever means that is, be it telephone, um, text, cyber um, or post, and they respond to it. They lose money. They get on this terrible name, which is the name that the scammers use and we wouldn't want to use, but a sucker's list. 
um, and then they're targeted round and round again, and that's that's how it progresses. And the consequences can be not only do they use lose a lot of money um, and the financial consequences of that, but clearly it has an impact on everybody's health and well-being. Um, people that have been scammed, I have known um, who, you know, there are people that have taken their own life and that's been in the papers before as well. But also those people are more likely, if they're older, they're more likely to end up in care, two and a half times more likely to end up in care than their peers who haven't been defrauded. Um, it can lead to debts and, you know, poor mental health. And I'm sure we all know somebody who has been scammed and who's just embarrassed and ashamed. And sadly, that sometimes means that they don't then talk about it. And we all do need to talk about it because that's how we'll win. You know, we need to make it a conversation that's ongoing so that we can um, tell people what's happened to us. And all of us are included in that. We can all get caught out. So another area is the postal scams. And this is uh, an example of a letter that was sent typically to, to somebody and that they uh, withdrew money from and carried on sending uh, money to. And you can see the reasons there why they felt they um, had to respond, even though they had barely any money left themselves. Now, the scam marshal scheme is a really um, effective scheme, actually. And going back to the postal scams, I visited a lady a few years ago um, from the Tandridge area who um, had in her dining room it set up like a desk with her checkbook, all the letters that she received from scammers and wrote out every day to reply. That was her job. That's how she perceived it. It was her job to do that. She'd been an um, intelligent woman. She worked in the city banking. She was, you know, she was on it. Um, and in the same way, she saw this as her job. Um, when I left her house with the PCSO, who I'd also gone with, the post was being delivered and on that day, there were 30 letters and 30 of those letters were all scam mail. So if you imagine that that lady was sitting there responding to that letter with an average of, say, 30 pounds, and that's probably a very conservative estimate, she was sending 30 pounds to each of those 30 letters every day, every week, every month for at least two years. She spent thousands. And um, when at the end of my visit to her, I talked to her about becoming a scam marshal for us. So what that means is, as it says there, they can talk to their family and friends. So they're raising, helping us to raise awareness. And also, um, as I said to her, she's working for us. So effectively, she's volunteering. She felt then that she was doing something worthwhile. Um, so instead of sending money to the scammers, she was sending the letters back to the national scams team who could yet then use that for information so that they could try and disable those um, people from sending the post over or it was intercepted before it got to households. So they helped take a stand against scams. And if you know anybody that, you know, would like to do that for us, we'd be very grateful. Helps us with intelligence. And with this particular lady, I went back to visit her again about two years later. And um, to be honest, I'd forgotten that I mentioned the scam marshal um, arrangement to her. So when I went back to visit her, I said, you know, you still get in the post. And she said, oh, no, dear. She said, I'm, I'm a scam marshal. I work for you. I've been sending it off. And um, coincidentally, when I left that day, the post was also delivered and there was one letter and it was legitimate. So it had a really positive income because like the cycle of responding will increase those responses. Likewise, if you stop responding, they will diminish. 
So another thing that we can do is that we have call blockers for landline phones that we can install for free. Um, so anybody in Bucks and Surrey that you know that would like a free call blocker because they're being pestered with telephone calls through their landline, we can install those um, and they're very effective. They work well. I won't cover that because um, Mark's already covered it, the text scams. Um, doorstep crime. So for those of you who don't know, if anybody comes knocking on your door, a, I would suggest you don't deal with them would be our advice. But also, if anybody comes to your house to do any work for you, um, you're entitled to a 14 day cooling off period for any contract carried out in your home. Now, the rogues of this world will either not use that or they'll use all these things here. You know, we're working next door. Um, we're only in your area this week. We thought we'd help you out with that loose tile on your roof. Any of those things. Um, and they will quite often, you know, tell you lies about that loose tile or any other means on your. On your property, so rule one, don't deal with them. And obviously you should also get the 14 day cooling off period in writing from them and don't be pressured into signing it. Um, to say that you're going to waive those rights for them to start immediately because the impact of those for some people can be devastating. Um, this is pictures of a property which was visited by a doorstep caller. The couple were in their late 80s um, and they wanted some work doing on their property. But when they went to the hospital for an appointment, when they came back, this is what they found. Their house had been gutted, really. Um, they were told that the walls had crumbled and fallen down. And therefore that more money would be needed to make good this work. They were attempting to get from this couple £300,000. Um, they got several thousand, but not the full amount, because when they went to the bank, um, it was picked up and uh, we became involved with the case. Uh, it became a criminal prosecution and um, the builders, if you want to call them that, the criminals um, were sent to prison. So it was probably one of the worst cases of doorstep crime we've seen because the um, the impact on that couple were devastating and unfortunately before it went to call the the gentleman um, had died. So as I say the impacts of those are horrific. So as part of that we also devised the um, no cold calling packs um, so that people can put this with the yellow sign as you see there on their door to deter cold callers. Now, when this first came out, I must admit I was a bit suspicious, you know, like, is that really going to work? Are they really not going to turn up? And honestly, they may still turn up, but it's about empowering people as individuals to say, no, I don't deal with people that knock on my door um, and empowering you as the householder to say, go away. Um, and that does work quite effectively and it does reduce people that will call on your door as well. Um, we also have the scam sticker packs, which are also available free, obviously, to anybody that wants them. Um, and they also have the, the sticker packs in there with stickers you can put on your checkbook and on your phone to just to remind people and it's in the black and yellow colours for people who may have poor memory or dementia um, to remind them not to give out any personal details and not to respond to postal scams um, unless you know you know to post unless you know who you're dealing with for sure be suspicious so top tips um, you might see this sign in in building societies it's part of the financial um, the FCA and it's basically take five 
never disclose security details, as Mark said. Um, everybody's fishing for passwords and all sorts of things like that. Never give out your pins. Listen to your instincts. If it sounds a bit dodgy, it will be dodgy. Um, so I always think that's quite good messages to get out to people. Basically, you stay in control. Don't be hurried. Don't be persuaded um, to do anything in a rush. So um, reporting and advice. Um, we're going to send you some links. Natalie's going to send out some information on the slides to anybody on this call. Um, so it will have all the links for all sorts of uh, means um, of reporting and also for BSL users. Um, I think we did have another bit you of might information. might have to click, Linda. I don't know if it's actually. Ah, there you go. Thank you, Natalie. I was going to say we had the other bit there. Um, so yes, so you can um, report through the Citizens Advice Consumer Service on that telephone number, or if you um, are a BSL user or hard of hearing, you can use the Relay UK with the app to report it. And please, as I say, do report it. It's hugely underreported, and if we don't know, um, you know, we're limited as to what we can do. Equally, if it's something urgent, do call 999. Police will not be upset if you have a doorstep criminal on your door and you contact them. And equally, the 999 BSL service um, is there as well for BSL users. I think I've gone through two again, have I? Oh yes, congratulations. You're now a friend against scams. And I've hurried through that because I was concerned we were going to run out of time. But I think we're um, we're there. So what's next is that you can, if you would like, become a scam champion, which means that you can deliver within your own communities the messages about becoming a friend against scams. Um, so if you want to deliver the, the the sort of PowerPoint that I've done, uh, um, then there is one there that's already written um, and we can give you support on that. We have regular meetings for our scam champions who act as volunteers for us. And it's a great way of getting back to the community because we can't reach everybody. Obviously, we can do some stuff online and that's that's helpful. But it's really good if anybody's interested to go back within their own community, having been trained as a scam champion. Um, the next training session we have, I think, is the 14th of June in the morning at 10.30. If anybody's interested, it's on Eventbrite and you can sign up for it. We currently don't have a BSL interpretation for that, but if there is demand, that's something that we can look into. So do let either Natalie or myself know. Any questions from anybody to either Mark or myself? And thank you, Sarah, for your sterling work there. Can I, can I just say thank you very much to Natalie and Linda for inviting Thames Valley Police Cyber Protect to come and assist here. More importantly, Sarah, thank you very much. That's you over there. Thank you for what you've done. I've never done a, any presentation with BSL before, and I'm really in awe of what you do and how you can communicate that through BSL. So thank you very much indeed, and thank you for everybody listening. Yes, so um, I think Natalie is going to, if anybody does want to ask a question, then please do so, um, and Natalie can yeah, what um, I'll do is let me just quickly, um, I'll change the settings so that um, people can obviously turn their cameras on and unmute themselves if they would like to do so. Bear with me a moment. Yeah, so I saw one question there on the chat. So while you're doing that, Natalie, perhaps yeah. I'll answer that one. Um, yeah, somebody asked about, can I explain about the 14 day cancellation period? Um, there's some legislation that came out a few years ago now. And what that basically does is it makes, as I say, it, it, it legal requirement that anybody, 
So that's whether they turn up at your door unannounced or whether they you ask them to do some work in your house. Um, when they give you the paperwork relating to that, they should also give you a cancellation notice to say that you have 13 days to think about that contract. And it's um, it was you know put in place exactly so that people didn't feel coerced and bullied to react to um, that call first off. Um, so it's to give you 14 days to change your mind so that if they say, oh, it needs doing urgently, duh, 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 you can still think about that, take it to another family member, perhaps get another quote, you know, unless, of course, and there are provisos that you can waive those rights. And you do that perhaps in the case, as happened to me recently, <laughs> where your tank blew in your ceiling and you've got water coming through your ceiling. In that scenario, you would want, obviously, it doing the work doing straight away. If they don't give you a cancellation notice, um, that is a criminal offence. Now, not everybody knows about it. So to be fair, there's very, you know, there, I'm sure there are legitimate traders out there. Or well, I know there are who don't provide it, but it is there exactly for this menace you know, the menace of people that try and coerce you to get work done quickly and perhaps tell you porky pies in order to encourage you to, to do that work. Does that answer the question? I think uh, Caroline also has her hands up. Yeah, Caroline. Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, it's a, just a general, it's just this is from personal experience, and I'm not sure what the advice would be, but I was widowed very suddenly last year. And oh, um, yeah, uh, uh, at least, yes. Uh, but um, fortunately, I this guidance isn't there. Don't share your passwords with anyone. Thankfully, I did know the passcode to get onto my husband's phone and um, tablet. Um, and if I hadn't known it, um, I would have been incredibly stuck. I wouldn't have even been able to inform his friends that he died and um, there were all sorts of accounts and things that needed to be closed down. So what is the advice around sharing that sort of information? Because I'm very conscious now that if I were to pop my clog suddenly, you know, my children would have the same issues about how would they access information that's essential to um, dealing with the estate of somebody that passes. Do you want to take that, Mark, or do you want me to? Yeah, no, no I'm, I'm happy to take that as best I can. Um, firstly, I'm sorry for your loss. Thank uh, you. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that and asking a question. Yes, you raise a really good point. Um, it, it's clearly it's not a policing issue. However, the, there is guidance about it. And off the top of my head, I can't remember who provides that guidance, but I will uh, do a bit of research for you and I'll add that to my email to Natty so that sh that can be shared to you all. Uh, uh, hopefully that that will suffice. But in terms of sharing part of passwords, yes, I mean, it, at the end of it, it's down to trust. Uh, how much you trust you have now? The issue then obviously is on the other side of the coin is you could trust them and but that they they may have nefarious uh, activities going on behind your back, and that that's a dilemma for you. But in terms of you know people um, approach it end of life or just sudden, sudden bereavements as that will happen to yourself, clearly that is an issue. So I will look out for that research, and I'll make sure I add that to my slide set. Does, does that answer your question as best I can at the moment, please? Oh yes, I mean I was obviously able to navigate through it because I I did happen to know my husband's passcodes, mm. but um, he died unexpectedly and quite young, so it's something that you have to. I don't know. I, it's just a warning that yes, we do need to be secure, but there can be a little an issue of maybe being too secure. Yeah, I'll, I, I, I'll, I'll add that for you. Yeah. No. Yes. Equally, I'll add. My condolences, Caroline, what a shock for you. Um, yeah. I, I I think, um, you know, I I live on my own and my my daughters know my passwords um, because I do trust them. But, you know, I wouldn't share them with anyone else, obviously. So, yeah. Um, can, can I just move on and answer a couple of questions which I've seen on the chat, please? Sure. OK. Um, the, uh, Asmina, you asked the question about data breaches. 
Um, if this was my usual presentation, I would have covered content about data breaches within the presentation. What I will do is I will add that slide to my wider slide set that you all gain access and that will give you the uh, National Cybersecurity Center's guidance about data breaches. There will also be a handy infographic of, of, of what things you need to be aware of and what you need to do. Suffice it to say, those who don't know what a data breach is, basically it's when a service provider holds data about us as individuals, say we've been a, a, a customer or a client or whatever, and that um, companies had their servers breached. In other words, someone's gained access to them. They've extracted data and information. Usually it's customer records, databases. You know, occasionally it might be uh, intellectual property, but let's assume it's, it's about us. Now, all um, service providers, whoever they are across the world, should have obviously standards for what they can do. And it's obviously incumbent on them to make sure that the data they hold on us is secure. Now, even now, they still uh, as companies, and I'm not I'm not naming any company or saying it's UK based, it could be anywhere across the world. Um, they they store this data as an Excel spreadsheet, which is dark because that information is 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 basically available if anybody was to extract it. However, if they encrypt that data, in other words, they make it very difficult for someone to access it. Without the encryption code, you're not going to be able to gain access to that data. So the Information Commissioner's Office it gives good guidance about that, as does the National Cybersecurity Centre. And there are things that we can do if we are notified. Now, if there is a data breach and data has been breached, that company should tell the Information Commissioner's Office within 72 hours. And they, I think, me personally, they have a duty to tell us if data has been breached. And that does happen. So you should receive that as an email. Remembering, however, obviously look at everything in its own context. So if you get that data information or something comes out says your data has been compromised, click on this link and do that. Do please stop, think about it, go to another means by which you can contact that service provider and just check the veracity of that. Because if you don't check, you could unfortunately have been fished because of the information that's stored about us out there. So that guidance is there for you. Um, the, the issue about um, romance fraud was mentioned. I will also put a link into the Thames Valley website because Thames Valley Fraud uh, Prevention Officers, a couple of years ago through Dr. Elizabeth Carter, did quite a bit uh, about romance fraud. So there are a couple of good documents out there uh, that will give you uh, additional guidance information about that. But thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Mark. Um, there's a couple more queries in the chat, but I am conscious, Sarah, that you need to head off shortly. Um, so what I think I'll do is I will capture those comments, um, any questions we haven't been able to answer. Um, and once I send around information um, to you all after, um, I'll, I'll include a little document in that which has got the questions and, and we can kind of answer them in there. Um, yeah, what I will do is obviously we will share this recording um i'll stop it in a minute and um, we'll share this recording with you all um after the meeting that will be on our youtube i think it, our youtube is uh but i'm sure and trading standards um but we'll send you all a link um so that you've got that and also um obviously mark's um information sheets and also our own that will give you some of the links um to kind of who you need to contact for advice and whatnot um but thank you very much all for attending um and Can I just say one much. more quick thing that I meant to say? Um, apologies, I meant to say this at the end. Um, but um, if you get any telephone calls or texts about pensions, that is now illegal. They cannot do that anymore. So they will be a fraudster. And as of next week, um, the Prime Minister is going to announce that also um, other matters have been added on to that to extend it so um insurance and investment scams will be well scams anybody that calls you about insurance or investment it will also be a scam we don't know the finer details of that it's being announced next week by the pm but look out for that so you'll know for sure that that is a scammer all right Thank you very much for attending. Really lovely to see so many here. And thanks again to to Mark and to Sarah. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Well, thank and thank you, you, Sarah. Amazing.
Thank you very much. And again, thank you very much, Sarah, for, for your time in BSLing. This is really, really good. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks.